So you want to learn how to sue, right? Good. Because learning how to sue should be a norm. No different than people know that if there's a fire, find something to starve it of oxygen. No different than you know to move from one point to the other. You simply have to take the corresponding feet in the back and move it in front of the other one so that you can get closer to your destination. That's the same thing suit is for anyone who claims to be free, especially in the Western world. If you claim to be free in the primary mode of operation being slavery at all corners of life and you do not know how to sue, no different than someone jogging in place. Same position, but they're just jogging. They're jogging in place. But they're trying to convince others that they're covering some distance. Before we begin to go into all the details of the actual black and white of what Sean really looks like, what the mindset behind it is, and how to structure it, here are some other premise you must know. Suing is a world of nitpicking. Nitpicking that might somehow irritate you because you know better and you know the one nitpicking knows better also. One of those nitpicking is timeline. We went over accrual of claims. We went over discovery rule. We went over equitable tolling. We went over statutes of limitation. We went over the difference between amended complaint and supplemental pleading in all these videos. But the question is, so you know what statutes of limitation is, which is someone saying, hey, we have some type of immunity because of some deadline that you failed to meet. By asserting your right, you waited too long. Boo-hoo, goodbye, get away. Okay, cool, you know what that is. You know what discovery rule is. I'm not gonna go over it in this video. You know what equitable tolling is. I'm not gonna go over it in this video because we went over it. You know what amended complaint is because we already went over it. But, there's always a but. But what happens when amending a complaint intertwines with statutes of limitation? What do I mean by that? We filed a suit in January 1st. And interesting enough, that suit that was initially filed was not barred by statutes of limitation. Whether you evoke after the toll and discover a property or there was no need to at all. But now, maybe a year after the suit or so, with one thing happening after the other, you realize, oh, I have to amend this. Meaning, it's relating back to the first thing. No new information occurred, but the conduct that you're suing them for was the same thing. And you figure some things out that you need to kind of intertwine and tweak to perfect that initial suit. But now you realize that one year after you filed the suit itself, heck, maybe two months after you filed the suit, but whatever time period after filing that suit, the normal statute of limitation had been triggered. So now you do your amended complaint outside the time frame of the statute of limitation. The question is, does that statute of limitation apply or not? Because an amended complaint is no different than saying we're going to turn a blind eye to the first one as though it never exists and look at this more recent one. So this more recent complaint now, since you're filing at a later date, does it fall under scrutiny of statute of limitation? Since statute of limitation has in fact occurred. These are the small nuances that it will slap you with that you must know better. Because at the end of the day, that neutral acting judge, especially if you're on a federal level, they will act neutral. Now in the state courts, it's a hit and miss thing. Federal level, they really do act neutral. And that man or woman's job is not to point to you that um, you could have said this, and I knew you could have said that. They're not going to put anything in your mouth. Unless they see that you are this close and they 
put it in the form of a suggestion or throw some case law out there hoping you figure it out but for the most part they're not going to come directly and say hey this is what you should do so what if you amend a complaint outside of the statute of limitation well you can call on the issue of equitable tolling and discovery rule but that's not even necessary. Why? Let's read on. Amending a complaint after an expired statute of limitation. Statutes of limitations are obviously important to know about. When filing a complaint, since a plaintiff should make sure to file within the correct deadlines, but sometimes a plaintiff is permitted to correct or amend their complaint at a later point in time. Remember, in the video regarding amending a complaint, we went over the different ways you can do it without leave to do so and with leave to do so, depending on timeline mentioned in Rule 15 of Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Usually in most cases, if you look at the Rules of Civil Procedure in any state, it will be in Rule 16, 15, or 17. So amending a complaint is a normal course of thing, meaning you need to add a little bit of extra something that you forgot to or you need to remove a little bit of X or something or you need to fine-tune something in the most subtle manner that makes all the difference in the explanation okay cool that's normal people do that but what if you fine-tune that first suit after the statutes of limitation is the question now but sometimes a plaintiff is permitted to correct or amend their complaint at a later point in time even after the relevant statutes of limitation has quote run ie after the deadline has passed so what happens then? If a plaintiff is permitted to amend their complaint after the statute of limitation has run, meaning you do it within the time period without asking for a leave, or you do it with a leave to amend. And then through that leave to amend, instead of waiting for a response or not, you just attach and say, see, attach the amended complaint right then and there, put the amended complaint along with the leave to amend. You do that. And usually they will allow that because that's called a due process. If a plaintiff is permitted to, unless it's quote, a frivolous claim. And if it's a frivolous claim, you won't even get to the point of having an opportunity to amend it, especially if you're in the federal level, they'll just throw that out. Some people have their court cases thrown out in a in form of pauper stage without even them looking at the complaint. So if a plaintiff is permitted to amend their complaint, which is likely if you know what you're doing after the statute of limitation has run, sometimes Utah courts and this applies generally speaking to will treat the amendment as if it had been filed on the day the original complaint was filed rather than on the date the amendment was actually filed why is this is the question you should be asking this is called relating back quote unquote whether utah courts will relate quote unquote an amended quote back to the date the original complaint was filed depends depends on numbers of factors and here are the factors, which is the core of this video. For example, Utah court will relate back when the amendment involved a claim that resulted from the same conduct, transaction or occurrence or frame, referred to an original complaint. Meaning the amended complaint still refers to the same actions that led to the same violation that you're asserting. Or the same event that someone did against you as a tort or as a wrong is the same thing that you're amended. In other words, it's no different the foundation of it is no different. The foundation of the amended complaint is no different than the foundation of the original complaint. Therefore, it is viewed as though it's one and the same. The only difference is just the core explanation of what you're referring to as to how that event itself affected you. For example, if a plaintiff files a complaint against another person with a claim for assault, but later learns that the person's conduct was actually considered battered the plaintiff amended complaint will likely quote relate back to the original filing date because both your original assault claim and the new battery claim are based on the same incident meaning the same incident is the foundation but what you are seeing and how you are intricately claiming in a certain a turret or damages from that same incident is just a difference so even after a statute of limitation your amended complaint is still valid so long as the foundational incident did not change. Meaning, if the original complaint said, hey, Bob stole my pen. I'm suing him for theft. 
But then the amended complaint says, hey, Bob stole my pen. I'm suing him for fraudulent misrepresentation because he lied to me. That's permissible because the premise is Bob stole your pen. On the other hand, if you originally sued Bob for stealing your pen and you said, I'm charging him for theft, but then you amend the complaint and say, ah, oh, you know what? I'm now charging Bob for theft because he stole my bike, not my pen, or because it slapped me in the face at the store. That's not permissible because the incident, the foundation, AKA the cause of action is different. So when you all amend a complaint after statute of limitation, so long as the original complaint has a proper reason to not qualify for the statute of limitation, when you amend a complaint after statute of limitation, you are in the green, you are in the safe zone, so long as the cause of action is the same thing being amended. So long as your cause of action being amended does not differ from the original complaint. Your reason for damage can be different, but the incident itself must be the same. How you finagle it can be different. What you assert as a damage can be different, but the foundational cause of action, the incident, what occurred must be the same. In 2019, Utah Supreme Court decision, State versus Newark, a Utah inmate filed a complaint claiming that he received an ineffective assistance of counsel at a previous trial in a different case. Later in that case, after the statute of limitation deadline has passed, he amended his complaint. The amendment still, still, still included a claim for ineffective assistance of counsel, but relied on a slightly different reason than before. Meaning the foundation and the cause of action is still the same, but how he's finagling the cause of action is different, which will naturally occur. The human mind forgets information, omits information, and over time, you see your own correction by the clockworks and the dynamics of the case itself. And that is normal. Therefore, you can amend your claim even after the statutes of limitation, so long as the core incident, so long as the cause of action, so long as the foundation, so long as the event is still the same. The moment you alter the foundation, which is the event or the cause of action, then the complaint itself changes form as a whole because the cause can never result in something foreign of itself. Simple as that. Instead of supporting the claim by saying the previous attorney had done A, B, and C during the trial, the plaintiff now focuses on how the attorney done X, Y, and Z. Right. The defendant argued that plaintiff's lawsuit should be dropped because the amendment was filed after the statute of limitation deadline and should not relate back because it did not refer to the same conduct referred to an original complaint. In other words, this is what you have to do when you now amend your complaint and you know it's outside of statute of limitation. Even if you don't know, just put this clause. Like in any suit that you put clause of equitable tolling or clause of discovery rule, which will be shown in the new tear of how you structure that. It's just very simple words. Likewise, with this amending the complaint outside of statute of limitation, you simply put a clause that states that the claim within this amended complaint relates back and resulted from the same conduct of each defendant in the original complaint. Simple as that. That simple clause, that simple phrase will kill anything they have to say in the future regarding statute of limitation. And if they want to come in and remember I mentioned nitpicking, because it's their job. It is their job to nitpick on things even if they know that you are right and they are wrong. Once they start doing that trash, just make reference to line such and such, paragraph such and such, page such and such. Simple, keep it moving. You learn how to be a, a sniper with these things if you set the foundation properly. No different than actual war zones. Snipers require the perfect environment to cloud their presence so that they can take people out one at a time and just have them drop like flies. It's the setting and the foundation that you have to prepare. If you have the right, every other subsequent document, the reply, the response, the rebuttals, the supplemental pleadings, all of that would simply refer to the foundation, which is that complaint, whether it be the original complaint or the amended complaint. And by the way, a complaint can be amended as much as three separate times. So when you amend a complaint, you would, it will be first amended complaint, then second amended complaint, 
and third amendment complaint that would be the title of the document the utah supreme court agreed with the plaintiff it found that even though the amended complaint talked about different specific conduct exhibited by the previous attorney it was still essentially talking about the same conduct meaning the foundation did not change aka essentially it was just how they finagled it how they said you know what the same thing this was the damage that came out of it that was the only thing that differed what they're saying came out of it and what they're saying the other party did wrong but nonetheless the events the foundation is still the same thing it is extremely important the previous attorney's action in a specific trial therefore the amended complaint quote relate back in this particular situation an amended complaint may also relate back when it includes a new but now correct party to the lawsuit that's another way for it to be fine meaning you won't sue the wrong party not a problem meaning not a problem you can sue them through an amended complaint even after statutes of limitation because well you open the suit that file case number it runs from the proper time and that's all that matters the amended complaint is lodged under that same file case number so it's as though it was opened the same day that file case number was open that's the key an amended complaint may also relate back when it includes a new but correct party to the lawsuit so that's the issue of subject matter now they're speaking of parties for example mary falls while shopping at neighborhood grocery store due to the store's negligence she files suit against neighborhood groceries shortly before the statute of limitation expired but later discovered it is actually owned by a national grocery chain meaning they're doing business as and there's a holding company yep many people make this mistakes also she amends her complaint to remove neighborhood grocery as the defendant and replace it with national national grocery chain mary's amendment will likely relate back as long as national grocery chain knew that mary intended to bring the suit against it but was mistaken about the proper party name as long as national grocery chain will not experience prejudice this is one of the elements of equitable tolling but that was just some article right so why not just go to the horse's mouth? Because those articles summarize something based on some principles that these courts follow. Remember, always, always remember, these people follow a box, a limitation of algorithm. That's somewhere, somehow, in black and white. We mentioned Rule 15 according to how amended complaint works. Well, that same Rule 15 actually tells you the importance of relating back an amended complaint. So in case these opposing attorneys want to pull the wool over your eyes and just list all these case laws after case laws saying, look, this guy did something wrong. Ignore him. Something is wrong with him. He doesn't know what he's doing, which believe it or not, they will come at you from that perspective. They will attack you on pen and paper. Well, look, here it is in black and white beyond conjecture. Rule 15. Amended and supplemental pleading and C relation back of amendments so we read the layman's words in everyday man's language we explained it through examples so some might think wow well, well that's just Utah even though it was in a Supreme Court of Utah those decisions that we just read that was summarized was in a Supreme Court and Supreme Court decision on the state levels are adopted in the federal levels also just as much as Supreme Court decision on the federal levels is adopted in the state level so long as it's the Supreme Court, because that's the constitutional court that makes final determination of legislative interpretation. But let's just say someone still doesn't believe in that, or you know, you want other references, the legalese. No problem. Let's read the legalese. Rule 15c, relation back of amendment. That same relating back principle, they give it to you in black and white. When an amendment relates back, they give it to you an amendment of a complaint or a pleading in this case amended pleading an amendment so we're not speaking about bill of right amendments here just to be clear we're speaking about an amended complaint an amendment to a pleading relates back to the date of the original pleading when and in here the criteria is that says look even if you amended a complaint it is still viewed as though it was an original pleading aka the original complaint without being a separate timeline. 
an amendment to a pleading relates back to the date of the original pleading when the law that provides the applicable statutes of limitation allows relation back. Most statutes of limitation often lacks the language of relating back. They don't even mention relating back at all, except for cases like bankruptcy and antitrust law and RICO laws against organized crimes like the mafia and things like that. Right? They, they really go hard on those end. So if you're doing things like tort claims, that's just a limitation related to tort in all states that does not have limitation when it comes to relating back. In fact, it has language of accrual, aka discovery rule. So this first part doesn't apply. B, the amendment asserts a claim or defense that arose out of the conduct, out of the transaction or occurrence set out or attempted to be set out in the original pleading, meaning the conduct, the foundation, the circumstance, the action of the torpedoer, the one you're suing. It's the same thing that you're speaking of in an amended complaint. Therefore, it relates back to that first suit as though it was the original pleading. That's what B tells you. C, the amendment changes the party or the naming of the party against whom the claim is asserted, meaning you sue the wrong party. Look. Not a problem, you have the chance to sue the right party so long as you brought the original suit within the proper timeline. Not a problem, the file number is what we're looking at though. The date you open the file number, well, that's the same day the amended complaint will relate back to. If you just so happen to sue the wrong party, just like we went over in that article we read first. Same two principles summarizing that article is right here within the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 15C, relating back of amendment. The amendment changes the party of the naming or the naming of the party against whom a claim is asserted. If rules 15C1B, which is relating to the circumstance rather than parties, is satisfied, meaning changing of names of party is now contingent on the same principle and conduct. Meaning you can't create a new conduct and event. Why? Because that's an entire suit of its own. It's not relating back to what you mentioned in the first document in the first complaint this second part when it comes to changing of name is what that article did mention because when you do change names or add the proper party the conduct that gave rise to the damage still has to be the same so the conduct itself is the core of any type of amendment no matter how you look at it whether you are adding or removing new parties the amendment changes the party or the name of the party against whom a claim is asserted if rule 15C1B, which is a prior item, is satisfied, and if within the period provided by rule 4M, rule 4M deals with summons and service of process, for serving summons and complaint, the party to be brought in by amendment, which is, if after you've amended the complaint and you added a new party, you still have to send them a summons, because now, you added a new party and it has to be done within 60 to 90 days depending on whether it's a quote governmental party or a private party i received such notice aka the summons of the action that it will not be prejudiced in defending the merits and knew or should have known that the action would have been brought against it but for mistakes concerning proper party's identity simple as that if you amend your complaint, so long as the substance and the event and the conduct is still the same, just go ahead and serve a summons within the same time period that you would have had in the original complaint. But if you're not adding a new party, no problem. It's even easier. So long as the conduct and the principle and the event that give rise to the damage, and in the core, the circumstance, aka the cause of action, is still the same. Not a problem. Amend all you want. And then the next part tells you if you're suing in the United States, you have to send a notice to Attorney General. Simple as that. And then D goes into supplemental pleading, which we'll run over in the next video. With that, we've went over the core of World Rule 15 when it comes to amended and supplemental pleading is. With all these video thumbnails that I've shown in addition to this video. At the core of how court system works. That those who are telling you, oh, they didn't do this, sue them. They don't know these things. When someone tells you valiantly, oh, sue them or you can sue them or send them some 
administrative process. If people are telling you to send an administrative process to do notary protests and you don't know how to sue, whoever is instructing you to do administrative process and they're not showing you how this court system works and how to sue, they are setting you up. That's the reason why 90% of the people, they do all these paperwork and then they just get stuck because this is the final thing they're missing. They deep down intrinsically, subconsciously know they're missing certain intricacies and if they dare step into this world, they'll be chewed up. They will be chewed up alive and guess what? That's exactly what happens. Then you get the news of people telling you, oh, this happened, they railroaded me, they did this, they did that, they're fraud. No, you did not know what you were doing. You did not know the details. You did not even know you had an option to do something, let alone the intricacies of those options. Can you believe most people are not even aware that they can amend a complaint, let alone what that even constitutes in its details? The real power comes in being able to simplify this in pen and paper in black and white and be able to organize it properly so that when someone reads it, the strength is in there. See, everything we just spoke about in this video you can write it on a five page document just to prove one simple point. But if you can prove one simple point, in one sentence or one page, that's better. That is what a lot of people also don't know. But before we get to that point, it is my duty. It is my responsibility to show you these rudiments as a stepping stone to kind of start to get your mind rolling. Yeah, you might be motivated to sue. You might say you're ready, but still know these basic principles because when we start to show it on black and white we can explain it also but let's go through these basic stuff first that they say before we start showing you what you will be saying if you don't know what perspective they have first then what you'll be saying would always conflict and you would always wonder why what you're saying is not working it's called art of war know your opponent and know the playing field always keep that in mind till next time take care Best of luck. I have a Patreon page and I'm inviting you to come join. But are you interested in this charge? We show everything about how it's done and my own experience. Consistent posts are made explaining many things regarding said discharge. Many will seek and simply wouldn't find. Those dealing with mortgage issue or want to know more about it, we speak of it. For those dealing with basic stuff like traffic issues, we speak about the solution and I show it from my own experiences and how I permanently prevent any such issues. Those worrying about trust, different types of trust, we go over so many things consistently. We got in trust, we show the IRS manuals. Those who are interested in suing and making money through debt collection or other means, we go over it, we show it. I show my own settlement checks and the things that I've done as a personal experience. Those interested in banking, we show subtle details and intricacies of the things that I have learned those interested in other things like the IRS forms and how to put it to use. We show it, we explain the details. For those interested in court related matters and intricacies, we always show it. For those interested in the spiritual aspect of things and how it works, we show and explain it. For those with child support matters, we explain and we show everything in detail also. Great puzzle pieces that can never be found in other social media platforms, but we explain it all as it relates to many different things those interested in express trusts and the issue of how not qualifying for vexation, which I call dinging, how it relates to any other type of trust or any other affairs and how you can intertwine your affairs into the different types of discharge that exist and lack of qualification for taxation. Speak about it. The truth about really accusing attorneys and the whole foreign agent registration and attorney lawyer number, we speak about it. We speak about how to really bring about juries and some of the comment section asks good questions and where the answers are given speak about how to get and use tax exemptions for vehicle use and sales you don't have to belong to some organization you can actually get yours according to the language of the legislature within your state go over the details that a lot of people mentor about regard article 1 article 3 what really makes a court it's not limited to just your paperwork most people don't know we go over business matters for those with actual businesses, S Corp, C Corp, LLCs, those who are business minded and those who make money. We go over other things that a lot of people don't know functions internationally. 
We speak about a lot of other spiritual related matters. Details on how to bring criminal charges, what it truly means to bring criminal charges, what a bill of particular is, how to recuse a judge, details of the parliamentary rules in court and legislature, different things about standard of evidence and burden of proof, different things that a lot of people who speak of, discovery, discovery. But did you know there are six types of discoveries? You know how to intertwine your LLCs and S-Corps with an express trust, how to not make them taxable? Do you know when to reverse Sprague Arrow really is involved? Do you know how to use your home as a home office? And the many, many details involved. Go over the injunction and how to enforce the, the different types of injunctions that exist. The intricacies of how data brokers exist and how they store the information. Not just the credit bureaus, but many, many data brokers and how you can prevent them. We go over grants, getting grants. We go over issues and solutions of CPN and how they're created. There are about six or four to five different parts that were created. We go over caveats where people say sue them, but they don't really know. We go over the things to do after you sue them. We go over the issues of privacy and technology. All the whole thing about perfection of security interest, the UCC and how to use it and how to monetize the birth certificate, all that. <laughs> we go over the details. There are a lot of principles and documents people don't know about that we go over. Go over how to really do the copyright and the details involved in it. We go over how to simply do a trademark. It's far more easier than you think. All these people telling you go to a trademark office, do this, write this letter it's not that difficult to go over how to fill out the gsa bond box at a time and so many more how to get settlement checks how to put your vehicle in a trust i show you from my own experiences form for form step by step to go over the different types of relief to be granted the type of relief you seek invokes the type of jurisdiction that you fall under. All these people speaking about chancery, equity, at law, common law, the relief that you seek is directly tied to the type of jurisdiction. You go over the CPN, how it's created. You go over how to obtain bonds, where to do it. You go over the different types of discharge and some more. We explain each of those types of discharge. We explain how trademark and copyright is associated, affiliated with asset protection. We go over how to prove trust. We go over the different types of fraud. We go over the importance that many people would never know. So many more. I show my own experiences in the audio calls from court cases of how I get different types of sediment checks. We go over the different types of discharge. There's so much more that we can't even completely be spoken of here regarding trust. We go over how to create it step by step and many more things that will never be shown YouTube or any other platforms go over other principles that people don't know about and they speak about statute of limitation well fraud does have a statute of limitation but do you know how to subvert it as to why that free fraud has no statute of limitation to bring it to life most people don't know there's so many things that we speak about we speak about how to garnish people's checks and people's property there's a form that you use for that people don't know about it speak about details regarding foreign trustees Speak about spiritual related matters. And on the Instagram page, if you get to join, come on over. There's also a Facebook page where questions and answers are posted and other reminder links to certain videos are shown. Till next time, take care. Best of luck.